microphone to do very well tonight. This thing on. Something got adjusted with it last week to where it didn't carry my voice as much. So I had to preach really loudly this morning. And then because of that, uh, my voice has been suffering all day. So it doesn't matter too much if you only do church in one place, whether or not you have sound. But if you try to speak too many times in a day, you just can't handle it. So, well, I shouldn't say you, I can't. So. If you found your place in Haggai, look down to, or over, I should say, probably, to chapter 2. And uh, this message we've preached before, but it is such a vital insight into the heart of God and into what God wants from us. I just think we can't have enough messages like this. It does tie in very well with the series we've been looking at on revival in, in Nehemiah and now in Ezra. And so, the, of course, Haggai uh, would be a contemporary of Nehemiah and Ezra, and Zechariah as well was a contemporary. So if you'll think in terms of guys who were all alive at the same time and who would have known each other and been peers and actually have influenced each other for the good spiritually, these four guys in particular, or the, the writers, authors of these portions of the Scripture, would certainly be uh, guys that were not only friends, but knew each other and were used by God to exhort each other. And I will say as well that it is not coincidental that during this age or period of revival that God was using prophets to pen Scripture, is it? It's not coincidental because God's people were interested in God's Word. And so God gave His Word, much like in the era of the age uh, when the New Testament of the Scripture was penned. You ever think about how fast the New Testament of the Scripture was given to the people versus the period of time that elapsed before the Old Testament canon was complete. Of course, that would have covered a, large, a much larger span of years. Why is it that God, though, was working so much at this time? Well, because there was revival among God's people. And so let's read our text beginning in chapter 2 and verse 1 tonight. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once, it's a little while, and I'll shake the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land, and I'll shake all nations. And the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now there's more to what we'll look at in the Scripture this evening than this beginning of the text, but this really introduces us to what we're going to look at tonight. So, Father, we pray that you would grant to us understanding as we go to the Scripture now. We pray and ask for the power of your Spirit in the preaching. Amen. Amen. Well, this is very, 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 uh, the, I think one of the kindest passages of Scripture that really help you understand what we call the tender mercies of our Lord. God is very tender, very merciful. Very, very careful. You know, some people demonstrate mercy and they're less tender about it. I would say I'm not a tender mercies kind of a guy. My wife will tell you I'm extremely merciful. Some of y'all say, well, I don't know if I believe that or not. Well, you should because you're still alive. So you have every reason to believe it. So <laughs> that's the way my mercies are tended out or meted out. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that actually I am pretty patient with people. I, I don't quit on people nearly as quickly as a lot of other folks do. You'd be surprised. Uh, yeah. Sometimes my wife will say, you know, 
It's been way too long. You have taken, you know, that person's have had every chance. And usually before I deal with somebody in a final way, I deal with them in a continual way. And it takes a lot of mercy, actually, to confront somebody or to deal with someone when they're wrong versus to just let them do wrong and let them self-implode. Self and uh, many, many ministers' style of uh, pastoring is to let people just kind of implode and then it's, their, it's on them, it's their problem, it's their fault. And I try not to let that happen for people. And so anyway, my point would simply be this. God, is, God can be very, very direct and very much of a chastiser, but God can also be very, very tender and very, very merciful, very comforting. And that's what we see in this portion of the Scripture. First of all, God asked these individuals, He's not just speaking to Israel, He's also speaking to Joshua, the high priest. And he asked the question, it seems like an unkind question, but it isn't. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So Solomon's temple or Zerubbabel's temple? How many of you remember Solomon's temple? We remember reading about it. But when this was written, when God gave Haggai this message to Zerubbabel and to Joshua, there were people still alive that remembered Solomon's temple. They'd be old. They'd be pushing 100, probably approaching 100 years of age, many of them. But they remembered Solomon's temple. And the scripture, the prophets account that when the foundation was laid and the temple began to be... We'll throw a chair down for dramatic effect. When the temple began to be rebuilt, hey, by the way, teenagers, when we bring those in, as soon as they get out of Sunday school class, instead of putting those there, we should put them uh, in the Sunday school room on the back wall. I indicated that this morning in words, but I didn't communicate it in actual concept because it didn't end up that way. But uh, that's just to make it so we don't look as cluttered. If you would be careful to see things through the eyes of visitors when you come in here, and that would be for all of us, it would help us to look less haphazard and like we don't know what we're doing. So, you may not know what you're doing, but let's try to look like it. You know, that, that'll help. That way, those of us who know everything that's going on could give a good impression. <laughs> uh, okay, so these individuals who, with their eyes, had actually beheld Solomon's temple, wept when the temple began to be rebuilt. And what they were weeping over wasn't that it's being rebuilt again and I'm so touched, I'm so moved. You ever had something so moving you're just rejoicing and you had tears of rejoicing? These were not tears of rejoicing. These were tears of this temple's terrible. This thing compared to what we had. And if you read about the wisdom that God gave Solomon to design the temple and about the, the special cunning and wisdom that God gave the developers of Solomon's temple, you'd recognize that today with all the technology we have, we couldn't build a temple like Solomon's. I mean, just the materials that went into it and the craftsmanship that went into it just couldn't be rivaled. And so what do we have here when Haggai's writing this? Well, we have a temple that God challenged the people through Haggai to rebuild. If you're familiar with the first chapter of Haggai, the question is, is it time for you to live in fancy houses while God's temple isn't being rebuilt. And they were reminded how much they were trying to accumulate for themselves and how much they were lacking. You put your money in a bag, the scripture says, and it's like a bag full of holes. You plant a crop and yet your crop doesn't even produce what you planted. You till your land and there's blasting and there's mildew and there's hail. These things all happen to you Try me. See what will happen if you build the temple. So God wanted the temple to be rebuilt. And they began to rebuild it. And yet, when it began to be built, the old men literally sobbed because it was so pathetic compared to Solomon's temple. And you know, you and I can sort of relate a little bit, can't we? You ever do your best and it just seems so pathetic? You ever just go all in and you just think, you know, I'm just pathetic. 
I mean, you pour your heart into something, you uh, invest in something, and you're really doing it as unto the Lord, and you look at it and you're like, that's just pathetic. <laughs> I mean, it's just the very best of it, it's pathetic. Zerubbabel is in the line of a of rightful king of Judah. So he's a legitimate heir to the throne of David, but he's a legitimate heir to the throne of David when Cyrus is king of Persia. And when Cyrus is king of Persia, nobody who calls himself as king is going to be anything more than a puppet for a king or anything more than a fake king. Without becoming a rival of Cyrus. And so Zerubbabel as a king was actually kind of pathetic. Cyrus said, go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the city, build yourself a temple there to God and mention me to God. So that's what he did. He was literally an ambassador in many ways for Cyrus. That's kind of pathetic when you think about a king and the testimony of God, isn't it? Joshua, Yeshua, priest, faithful man. This is what he has to work with. A king in name who is a rightful king as far as his inheritance, but as far as his authority, he's not much of a king. No comparison with Solomon. And a temple that makes the old men that have seen Solomon's temple cry because it's so pathetic. That's the situation. And then God says to Haggai, Haggai, here's a message. Go tell these guys, is this temple pathetic or what? <laughs> Here I have something that you know is pathetic and you don't need to be told it's pathetic. How does it feel when you're told something's pathetic that you know is pathetic? It's like when Taj cuts his own hair and I ask him if he cut his own hair. Anthony reminded me about this today. I would never come up. I remember what time, one time Mr. Taj cut his own hair. And I actually was not slamming. I actually wasn't getting even teasing him. And I just asked, did you cut your own hair? Because I didn't know he didn't normally cut his own hair. But he felt so badly about his haircut that when I asked him if, you, if he cut his own hair, it didn't make him very happy to be asked that. <laughs> it's just something about when you're not happy about something and somebody else says, you happy about that? People think that they need to let you know sometimes, don't they? And it seems, in a sense, that's what God's doing. Zerubbabel, you're pathetic. Haggai, you're pathetic. Joshua, you're pathetic. Only that isn't what God was saying. God said in verse 3, Who is left among you that saw in this house, saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? And here we see very, very clear pronouns in the Scripture. Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? In other words, don't you see this as pathetic from your vantage point, from your viewpoint? Listen to me now, Christian. This will help you. God asked these men, how does it look to you? Does it not look like nothing in comparison with Solomon's? Does it look pathetic? And what's their answer? Yeah, we're not impressed with the work of our hands. We're not impressed with our plight. We're not impressed with what we've done. And yet in verse 4, God said, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. And now God says, Because you're not as pathetic as you may think, for I am with you saith the word of hosts. First, in verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear you not. Now I want to I hearken back just a little bit to Jeremiah's day, hundred years or so before. I want to hearken back to a time when Solomon's temple was still there in all its glory, and God said, this temple's going to be torn down. And the people said, the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord is at Jerusalem. In other words, what they implied was, God's here and this temple can't be torn down. If you read Ezekiel about the temple, you see God's glory had left the temple. 
So if you, or I, or Haggai, or Joshua, or Zerubbabel, were to view with our eyes Solomon's temple, we'd say, amazing, unbelievable. I mean, I've seen some things that men have built, and I've thought, I don't have words. It's unbelievable. Solomon's temple would have been just such a thing. But God wasn't there. And that's pathetic. And God said to these people who had a pathetic temple, He said, I'm here. Now what's pathetic? A superstructure where God is not or a pathetic structure where God is. I'm reminded, friend, we don't need impressive words, fancy music, dramatic invitations for people to respond and be saved. We don't need edifices, structures, and large grandiose bank accounts for God to do big things in individuals. We need God. And a lot of the time when it comes to the structures, when it comes to the things and the places, a lot of times if you really examine them from man's eyes, you'd say, bless their hearts. <laughs> That's pathetic. You always bless someone's heart before you slam them. That's the southern way. And we're in the deep south. God said, looks pathetic, but I'm here. And I coveted with you in Egypt that I'd be here. I'm here. And then God mentioned something that ought to help us with perspective. First of all, He said, and my spirit remaineth among you, fear you not. He said, don't be afraid. Don't worry about whether I'm here. I'm here. I've shown up. I've arrived. I'm here. I just want to tell you something, Christian. I've certainly come to a place in my life where I want to be where God is, and I don't care where that is. Geographically, I want to be there. I've found that I like geographically pretty much anywhere. I've seen some lovely places, some lovely things, but if God is not there, there's nothing there. And I've been in some places where there isn't much to see, but if God's there, there's a lot to see. There's a lot there. And now God says in verse 7, He gives a promise about it, the Messiah, I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I'll fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. It's a future event. And then God reminds them, the silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, He's not speaking of Zerubbabel's temple. He's speaking of the temple that God's going to set up when He rules and reigns. And it again works through national Israel when the church is done. And the glory of that latter place will be greater than the former. Who owns the gold and who owns the silver today? The heathen? They're holding it until God collects it. Just like the Egyptians. Remember the Egyptians? Man, they, they plundered the wealth of the world, didn't they? And whose wisdom did they do, use to do it? God's, through Joseph. And then they used the slaves to just amass enormous wealth. And then when the children of Israel left Egypt, <laughs> they took it all with them. Because God said this wealth leaves Egypt. Who owns the cattle on a thousand hill? God does. 
And God simply said to Zerubbabel, I'm not very impressed by something that is mine. If you think that this temple needs to be gold-plated for me to be impressed, fret not. I've got the gold in other places right now. It doesn't need to be here. Someday I'm going to put the gold here. I'm going to shake the nations. The desire of the nations is going to come. And we're going to build a temple whose glory makes Solomon's look silly. That's what I can do. Friend, don't fret about not being impressive in a way that only God can. Don't fret about being impressive in a way that man can. Fret, if you will, about what God sees from you. And God said about Zerubbabel, He said, I'm with you. Now I want to draw one last contrast, if you will permit me, and go to Jeremiah chapter 22. I want you to see something that God said about Kaniah, ancestor, of course, of Joshua. Verse 24, God said in verse 24 of Jeremiah 22, As I live, saith the Lord, though Kaniah were the son of the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, Yet would I pluck thee thence, and I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life. Signet would be a ring with a seal on it. A ring with a seal on it like that which was used by the king to seal the, the lion's den when Daniel was put in it. A signet was a ring used by royalty to seal something in a way that said this thing is finished, it's done, it's a finality thing. The king wrote a letter and he put his signet on it. It was sealed. It was completed and it was unchanged. And God said through Jeremiah to Kaniah, He said, if you are the signet ring, the seal, the final last word on my finger, I take you off and throw you away. much as you think you're permanent. Why would he think he's permanent from God's perspective? Well, he'd think he was permanent from God's perspective because he was a descendant of David. And because of who he was, he was untouchable. And God said, I'll tell you how untouchable you are. God's Word emphasizes a lot of things about God manufacturing descendants and so forth. Remember what God told Moses when the children of Israel sinned? I'll make some more. I'll fulfill my covenant with Jacob. I'll make some more. God's able out of these rocks to raise up children unto Abraham. Remember that? Nobody's permanent. Nobody's untouchable. You can't take God's promise towards you and use it against Him. But now go back to Haggai. Go back to chapter 2 in the end. I want to look at verse 20. Again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, it's 21, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, he's called a governor, he's a king, and he's called a governor. Saying, I will shake the heavens and earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. Verse 23, On that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and I'll make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Do you see that, verse 23? Shall we read it again? Some of y'all looking like, where's that at in the Bible? Chapter 2 of Haggai. Verse 23, And that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and I will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. His rebellious forefather, God said, If you are a signet on my hand, I'd take you off and ditch you. And God said to Zerubbabel, He said, In that day, when that impressive temple is built, 
when I shake the nations and the desire of the nations comes. In that day, which is really the peak, the zenith of God's working in the temple, Zerubbabel, you're going to be a signet. You're going to be a seal that I've chosen you. And friend, this is not a you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you moment. This is, you've been the most faithful king, and I've chosen you. This is like Esther when she was chosen to be the wife of the king. This is like God looking at all the kings of Israel. David, and Solomon, and Josiah. You look at all the good kings of Israel. And God saying, Zerubbabel is my guy. He's going to be the one that I use for a mark or for a seal of faithfulness, of impressiveness. This guy represents what I want from the heart of the man. And all of a sudden I look at Solomon and I say, you know, move aside. I look at David and I say, eh. God says Zerubbabel's the impressive guy. And so now when I read through Ezra and I read through Nehemiah and I read through the Chronicles and I see Zerubbabel, it's like, oh, Zerubbabel. That's the guy. That's the guy that impressed God. Because of the heart he had. God said, the building, not so much. The vastness of your kingdom, that's a joke. Your heart, it's the best. And that brings me to a New Testament reminder that you and I are all running a race. And you and I are supposed to run for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And in that race, we are ultimately going to stand before the judge. And he's not going to be impressed with the accumulation of gold or silver or with how many times you got your name on a building. He's not going to be impressed with how many books have been penned by you or about you, or how many people that you've influenced. He's going to be impressed by the same thing God's always been impressed by, and He's going to judge the same thing. What's in the heart? I fear too often as believers, we're more concerned with impressing people that would compare Solomon's temple and Zerubbabel's. Zerubbabel wouldn't do so well with that comparison. Matter of fact, it'd be, it would be not laughable. It would bring people to tears because it's so pathetic. And God doesn't think the way man thinks. God doesn't see the way man sees. And we cannot be reminded of this truth enough if we want to impress God. Pastor, you want to impress God? Yeah, I do. I do. Do you? There are examples in the Scripture that we can follow. And here this evening in this passage which demonstrates the tender mercies of God, we see a pattern. Just be faithful. Be one that stands for right. I mean, you can look in Ezra and you can read about Zerubbabel saying, you don't have any part with us, we're going to build this temple. When the adversaries of God said, oh, we want to build the temple with you, and they want to get involved. No, he, he stood for purity. So we're going to build this temple. You don't have any part of this. He's a man that just stood up and he just did what he should have done. He was everything he should have been. He wasn't born in the day to be King Solomon or King David or King... Tut or anyone else. <laughs> it was Zerubbabel. That's who God called him to be. And he did such a good job being Zerubbabel that God said, that's the one I pick. That's my signet. That guy there represents my...
This is what it looks like when you stamp God approves. Hope that's a help. Father, please help us to understand how to be Zerubbabel, so we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. According to Luke, you're dismissed. <laughs>